In the early 1990s, my perception of the American criminal justice system was forever altered when I read Peter Huber's book, Galileo's Revenge, Junk Science in the Courtroom. That book, published in 1991, is accurately described by the publisher as, quote, a scathing indictment of the growing role of junk science in our courtrooms. While Huber's book focused on civil liability cases, in this video I'm going to focus on junk forensic science that was used in criminal cases for decades and which resulted in the wrongful convictions of innocent people. I am Dr. John Padfield, I'm a business professor, and this is Business Reform, where I discuss issues at the intersection of business, technology, and society. In this video, I'm going to be focusing on the intersection of forensic technology and its impact on society. To keep this video short, I am turning this subject into a series of videos, and each one will focus on just one debunked forensic technique that has been used to convict and in some cases led to the execution of innocent people. The focus of this video is bullet lead analysis. The first time I ever heard of bullet lead analysis was in an episode of CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, a CBS police drama that ran from 2000 to 2015. In that episode, a bullet was recovered from a crime scene and a box of ammunition was recovered from a suspect's home. The bullet from the crime scene and a bullet recovered from the suspect's home were both then chemically analyzed in a crime lab and determined to be a match, thus proving the suspect was guilty. I remember that episode vividly because I remember my reaction to it. I laughed out loud. I thought the writers of the show had made up this forensic technique because I instinctively knew it could not be reliable. I was shocked a little bit later to learn that this actually had been a technique that had been used by the FBI in over 2,500 criminal cases between the early 1980s and 2005. Based on my background in statistics and manufacturing, I immediately saw two major flaws with this technique. The technique is based on the idea that lead used in bullets is not 100% pure, and that the exact composition of the impurities varies from one batch of lead to another. That much is true. However, the technique also assumes that the impurities are consistent enough from bullet to bullet within the same batch of lead that you can compare two bullets and determine if they came from the same batch of lead. That is not true. Let me illustrate with an analogy. Suppose you buy a box of cold medicine that claims each capsule contains 120 milligrams of pseudoephedrine. How do you know each individual capsule contains 120 milligrams? The capsule itself weighs 600 milligrams, so that means the capsule is only 20% active ingredient and 80% inactive ingredients, such as castor oil, colloidal silicon dioxide, cellulose, etc. Imagine these 80 yellow M&Ms represent the inactive ingredients, and these 20 red M&Ms represent the pseudoephedrine. This is what would be inside of a mixer at a pharmaceutical company making cold medicine. Ideally, every capsule would contain 20% red M&Ms and 80% yellow M&Ms. But if I don't do a good enough job mixing it up, when I reach in and I pull out my sample, I might not have the right ratio. In this one, it looks like I have a whole lot more yellow than I do red, so that I would actually have less than 20% ephedrine. I would have more than 80% inactive ingredients. There is a 500-page book that explains the links the pharmaceutical industry goes through to help ensure every capsule has a nearly identical mix of active and inactive ingredients so they do not accidentally overdose or underdose consumers taking their products. However, within the ammunition manufacturing industry, no such efforts are made to ensure that the impurities in the lead are equally distributed across all of the bullets that are being manufactured. This means even within a single box of ammunition, the percentage of impurities can vary significantly from one bullet to the next. The second problem with bullet lead analysis is the exact opposite of the first. Even if it were possible to match a bullet recovered from a crime scene to the batch of lead from which it was made, how many matches would you be able to make? In other words, how many bullets are produced from a single batch of lead? This is an M2R automatic casting machine from American Casting Equipment. 
it melts lead to make bullets. It has a 150 pound pot capacity, which means with this machine, it could make over 9,115 grain 9 millimeter bullets, or 182 boxes of 9 millimeter bullets. Large commercial ammunition manufacturers such as Remington use different processes, and I was unable to find out how many bullets they produce at a time. So I am going to be very conservative and stick with 182 boxes. There's a good chance all 182 boxes would be put on a pallet and shipped to the same retail outlet or gun store. If a person lives in a small town, there may only be one gun store in town. So anyone in town who buys a box of ammo from that store would be purchasing bullets that would be considered a match if their box of ammo was compared to another bullet taken from those 182 boxes that might happen to have been used at a crime scene. Unfortunately, this has actually happened and it has led to numerous innocent people being convicted. In 2007, the CBS News show 60 Minutes and the Washington Post collaborated on a story about the hundreds of defendants imprisoned around the country who were convicted with the help of a now discredited forensic tool and that the FBI never notified them, their lawyers, or the courts that their cases may have been affected by faulty testimony. In the November 18, 2007 60 Minutes broadcast, CBS correspondent Steve Croft interviewed William Tobin, a former chief metallurgist for the FBI. According to Tobin, the FBI's lab in Quantico, Virginia was the only place in the country that did bullet lead analysis, and the assertion you could actually match a bullet fragment to a specific batch or box of bullets went unchallenged for over 40 years until Tobin retired in 1998 and decided to do his own study, discovering the basic premise had never actually been scientifically tested. After conducting his own study, the former chief metallurgist for the FBI concluded the technique, quote, hadn't been based on science at all, but rather had been based on subjective belief for over four decades, and that it was, quote, worthless as a forensic tool. In 2002, the FBI lab got around to asking the National Academy of Sciences to conduct an independent review of bullet lead analysis, and their analysis found the model used by the FBI was, quote, deeply flawed and that the conclusion that bullet fragments could be matched to a box of ammunition so overstated that it was misleading under the rules of evidence. I have included a link in the description of this video to the National Academy of Science report that was published in February 2004. Just a year and a half later, in September 2005, the FBI announced it was discontinuing bullet lead examinations. The Innocence Project is a not-for-profit organization founded in 1992 that works to free innocent people who have been wrongfully convicted. They advocate for various reform measures in the criminal justice system including misused forensic techniques, which they have found to be a factor in 52% of the wrongful convictions they have successfully overturned. In the next video in this series, I'm going to be examining bite mark analysis and how it has led to wrongful convictions of innocent people. If you got something out of this video, please consider subscribing, and thank you for watching.